I'm another pesky architect who sneaked into the RIBA today. Very proud to be here. But I'm also a product manager. And what a product manager does is design things, whether they're aspirational, possible, impossible, and I pass them out to the team to design and actually make it technically work. So the role's relatively similar to the architect role in that I concept it and other people build it for me. So four projects. It has been a common data environment for a long time. It just wasn't called a common data environment. And then PAS 1192.2 came along and described it. So what one is, it's a tool where everything is gathered so we can manage and disseminate all of the relevant approved documents in the process. So that's what PAS 1192 called it. And lucky enough, PAS 1192 part three came along and said pretty much exactly the same, but sneak the word asset in there. So it's not just about delivering the project, it's actually having a common data environment on the client side where they capture their asset information model. So level, level two fundamentals that were released in the, the PAS 1192 document said, we aspire to use the, the common data environment for all the activities around the project information model, but they hadn't really firmed it up. They said it was a fundamental and said that it's aspirational. But a year later, when the asset information modeling part came along, part three, said we're not going to treat any information about the asset as actually your asset information model unless it's captured in a common data environment. So you've got all your information, disparate places. It doesn't count until you've built an asset information model in a common data environment. So for us, that was great news. Before then, we'd had quite a good penetration in the UK market with people taking up the, the processes that using process-led EDMSs can have. But now we had standards saying, if you're not going to use one of these, you're not going to meet these standards. So it was a, that was a big, big point for us. So PAS 1192 part two, has everybody read it? I imagine quite a few people from the UK have, some of the international colleagues will have. But in general, Wordle, Word Clouds are great. We're breaking it down a little bit though, because that's too noisy. What's in there? It's about data delivery processes construction design management, model standards. But at its very core, it's very repetitive around the project information model. So part two is about how you create a project information model. All that information from supply chain to contractor, throughout all of the design, gathering it into a nice, tidy set of data that is relevant to the project. And that's been defined as starting at stage one, or just before, up to handover, so all the information up to handover, tied up in terms of the documents, the models, and the non-graphical data. So here in the UK, that's Kobe, and everywhere else, it probably will be something that's very similar to Kobe, if not Kobe, because it makes a lot of sense. And luckily enough, the UK government did me a favor, so I didn't have to rewrite my graphics. When part three came along, asset was used even more than project was, but the information model is still the key phrase in both of these standards. And it's the same stuff, same documents, same graphical data, same models, but the other side of handover, but in a filtered manner. It's not everything that happened on the project. It's just what matters to the client, the operation manager or the facilities manager. So now I'm going to tell you a story. I know we've been getting into the high level of IFC, BCFs, and I'm really discussing some of the technical standards and some of the future. But now we have our client and he wants an asset information model. He's just, just heard of it, first time he's, he's heard of this and he thinks it's a good idea. And we're asking him to write an employer's information requirements document, exactly which documents, graphical data, and non-graphical data do you want? And as we heard from Dan this morning, this person who's just heard about asset information modeling is not gonna be in a position to write that. There's no standards out there to help him that are fully functioning yet, and he doesn't understand how to get the best out of this document. So he's probably going to employ someone. The BIM consultants of this world will come in and help and define which drawings, what flavor of Kobe, as Jeff showed you. There's the full Kobe, there's stripped down versions of Kobe. There's, you don't have to use it all. Only procure information that you need or you think you're going to need soon. And the models. What kind of models do I actually need in operations? Do I even need a model? So now we're ready. We've got our employer's information requirements. Or are we? Are we actually ready? Have we built in a repeatable, measurable process? Or if we've created an EIR, a next project, we're going to have to do it again. 
So this is where the Digital Planner Works comes in to help us plan in a consistent manner. But the Digital Planner Works in the Common Data Environment, there is some overlap there, but we're not competitors. They did come up yesterday that we might be competitors. But the, there's a plan put in place by the Digital Planner Works, but the Common Data Environment is there to help check that the information is arriving from the right people at the right time. So this will be populated from the Digital Planner Works. This is our information planner. Instead of calling it uh, an employee's information planner or a master information delivery planner or anything like that, we just call it an information planner. We're a global company. We can't just use British standards everywhere. People don't want to use all of them and all of our terminology. They might want to use the processors. I do apologize. But we need it to be more generic. So we called it an information planner, and we populate that from the DPAL. And if you haven't got a DPAL, just populate it manually. Who needs to deliver what and when? And at what level of detail? Which parts of that Kobe data set do I need at the stages of the project that are going to happen from briefing throughout to handover? Which, how much of that data do I need to achieve and uh, answer the questions that I need to answer? So that sets up our stage gates on the project. Start off relatively small at number one. Full set of data that we care about for uh, the operational phase at seven. So yesterday, whilst Stephen Hammer was talking, a tweet came through asking how we're going to work with the Digital Planner Works. Obviously, the room had the same thoughts as lots of people do. Where does the common data environment start and the DPAO end? Digital Planner Works is a planning tool. Now you deliver it through your common data environment, which we hope it'll be us. We, we, we've built a brilliant tool set, and we hope you all come upstairs and see it. Or, or check out the website or get in touch with us. But that's not the end of it. The DPAO has got some brilliant tech checking stuff in there because it has an XBIM engine in the background, checking geometry against level of detail. So we're helping with the checking of level of information, have you delivered the right Kobe, but the Digital Planner Works is helping with checking that geometry, making sure you've hit the level of detail people have asked for. And when we're comfortable that it's right, we can database that information. We can build that asset information model that past part three tells you that you've got to have or it's not an asset information model at all, so you can use it. Sounds like a manual process, pretty painful. But just like Dan mentioned this morning, we're all using IFC. This should transfer very easily. We don't think there's much development work to make this happen. When dig the digital planner work is finished, they'll pass us an IFC. That'll populate our information planner. We'll pass them IFCs back so they can check them. They'll send us the result. It may be BCF, it may be IFC, telling us the result. The IFC scheme is pretty clever at handling lots of different things. It's not just for models. It's very extensible to different purposes. And at the end of it, you've got an IFC full of checked information that complied with what you asked for at the start. It's a nice process. And in the instance that you haven't got a model, infrastructure projects, you haven't got an IFC, just do it with Kobe. Both standards are interchangeable between our systems as well. So now we're in a situation, we've got our client embarking on his first job to get an asset information model. And it's gonna look a bit like this on the end. You're gonna have the file store, the traditional four projects offering. Documents, drawings, so on. But you're gonna have a data store next to it. That data store we heard yesterday from, from Trimble isn't the typical SQL database, it can't be. This data's too big. We heard this morning I calling things big data. It's, it's a funny term but it is data that's big. So you're gonna to have to have a, a database that can return answers quickly. So we designed a database that could answer the question, if a client has 100 assets and he wants to know where he's used a particular brand of boiler that needs maintaining in the next 12 months, across his whole estate, how does he answer that question? Ask a SQL database, wait 24 hours, you might find out. Ask a NoSQL database, like Trimble were mentioning yesterday with Apache technology, that's gotta be much, much faster. So we've been working on that second part. Our file store's 15 years old, constantly developed, but it's a very mature piece of software. The data store's relatively new. And then we need to get a contractor involved, someone who's gonna deliver this one. Same things apply as usual. We wanna know that you can deliver the quality of build in the right time with the right budget. But now he's gotta give us this BIM execution plan to say, how am I gonna actually give you these documents, Kobe data, and graphical models, he's got to prove he's competent with that BIM execution plan. That's a hard thing to do, actually prove that you can do this. Because not just him, it's him and his supply chain. How do we get the information from the guy in the top left all the way down to the bottom right through the information exchanges? 
the client set up what he's going to check against. What information am I expecting? So he's got a client side CDE with his deliverables, so we can check them. Stage one, I'm asking for this information with that level of detail on the end with COBOL. Contract is going to have to have that same list. If you're using the same system, great. If it's all in one environment, great. If you're using two different systems, you're going to have to make those lists sync somehow. But he's got that list, but he takes a part of it and assigns it to the right person. He says, this is your work. Return it to me when it's done. So it gives you some data, gives you some models, some drawings, some documents. And you use our tools and say, actually, it's not good enough yet. You've still got 21 errors in that against what the client's asked for. We need some changes to that, Kobe. Go away, fix it. Great. And then the client's going to do those exact same checks. He wants to know that he's getting the information. He's not going to trust you that it's right. You say it's right. He's going to check it. So we've got stage one. Great. We're through the first stage gate. And we've set a process up. We know how to get through these stage gates and put information right there. Put the documents in the document store. Put the data in the data store. Throughout the project, go through the stage gates. Everything's great. Project one dealt with. But the slides are called getting from AIM to PIM and back again. What do we do after we've had a successful project? Do we start again from scratch? No, we don't. We've got a more knowledgeable client who understands what his EIR looks like, which documents matter to him, what information matters to him, and which mod models matter to him. So he's ready to procure another project without employing that BIM consultant to rewrite the EIR. Because he's got one. But there are some mistakes made on a project and some lessons learned. This is going to be a process of going through this a few times and making sure you get it right. So this is where we feed into the OIRs, the organizational information requirements, the asset information requirements for when we build a building which is similar to that first one. And the plain language questions, questions that we didn't think to ask the first time around. We want to ask the database something this time. We've, we've got to ask these questions. So we, we capture them. That means we've got a better EIR to go out to the contractor with. Contractor is going to reply with a better BEP. It makes sense. Right now, BIM execution plans are sometimes modeling strategies, sometimes lists of software that the contractor plans to use. Because they haven't got the EIR to respond to, they're answering a question that they haven't been asked. It's very difficult. Ask a better question, get a better answer. So we lead to better results. And you don't just do it once. It's a continuous improvement cycle of planning, doing, check it, act on it, and do it again. So we're getting better at the way we do this. So level two BIM, we're all going to start doing it in, in a few months' time. It's not long now. Our first one might be a bit of a rocky road, but we'll improve on that. So we had to build some software. As I say, we have a 15-year-old mature piece of software for handling documents, workflows, tasks. We've got a load of good kit in there, but we couldn't do anything with a model file. So the first thing we had to do was build a viewer. So we built a really good one using the XBIM engine out of Northumbria University in the BIM Academy. And some of the prerequisites for this was people have got to be able to use their kit. So two-year-old laptop, medium spec, has to work. That was one of our, our goals. You don't have to have really new kit to make this work because not everybody's got it. No installs. So we do it through a browser. Modern browsers, they all cope with it now. Easy to use toolbar, not everybody's an architect. You're going to have head teachers in here looking at schools, trying to negotiate their way through the model and understand things. And they're going to understand that information that's in there a lot better in the information panel from the property sets rather than looking at the Kobe at the bottom. The Kobe at the bottom is our tool for building the, the database up and what the database will eventually look like. Head teachers don't want to see that. Clients don't want to see Kobe. They just want to ask it questions. That's why it needs to be in a database that can be asked questions. And then we've got tools for creating tasks. Somebody spots an issue, or they find an issue elsewhere, they need to turn that into something that you can assign to someone. Clash, clash detection at the moment is great. There's some really quality tools out there. Celebri and Co. do great jobs of finding issues with models. But the process after that, when everyone sits in a room for, for a couple of days, comes up with 2,000 clashes, come back in a fortnight, and you might have 100 of them resolved, but you've still got thousands of clashes. You need to put a process around these issues. <laughs> So we export that to a BCF so the designer can be taken in his package back to where he needs to be. And he can respond with a revised IFC. Process works. Great. But can it be better? Yes, it can. 
You'll be able to respond with a BCF if, the, if there's, it doesn't require a new revision. If it's just uh, actually there is something different here, but I'm not going to make a, a new revised model. And then we've got these new BIM snippets. I'd heard of them before this week, but I've finally understood them when I spoke to Rasso earlier, earlier in the week. And these are small pieces of information attached to BCFs, like proposed changes to a model. I think this should be one of those. So we're just passing information from the designer back into that master information model in the common data environment and making sure we've got the right information using these BIM snippets. Great idea. Looking forward to implementing it. Other things that are in the tool? It's very hard to know what's changed between revision A and revision B of a model. So red, amber, green, what's been deleted, what's been added, what's been edited. That's a very easy tool for everybody to use. I've turned off the red stuff uh, for clarity, so it looks a bit better. But there are eight things that have been deleted and a number of things that have been added and changed. Very quick to see what the, the difference is. Select them, you can see what the difference in the properties are. But the really powerful stuff, having a viewer was great. We had to build one, prerequisite for BIM in many ways. We needed an overview. So we needed some tools to federate models, federate Kobe data sets, and then check the process. Are people naming their information right? Is the Kobe data rich enough to be right against that stage? And we need to contain that within your traditional tree so you know how to navigate that data. Tools like this one. This is turning BS 1192 into digitized code to say, how do we name files? But we know not everyone's going to do that. You want to be able to change this and tweak it. Project number might be 10 letters long in your world. You might not care about the zone because it's only a house. So you can tinker with this and make sure you get your, your naming convention right. And on the last side, you can see we've got a little explanation mark saying I didn't follow the naming convention when I set up this demo. I should have, didn't. Tools in here, not every time is there going to be a model. There's IFCs, IFC zips, but you will notice that for those at the back, it's just there, there's an Excel spreadsheet. Just so happens that's a Kobe shaped Excel spreadsheet. Click a button, we'll take that spreadsheet and we'll turn it into something that we can database and we can use. So it's taken simple files like spreadsheets and turn them into what before today I call big data, but data which is big is probably a better term. And we can, once that's database, we can merge that against its source model and things. So if it did come out of a model and went out to a subcontract and they've made some changes, but you've made some changes in our view at the same time, you've got three versions, original version, changed version in our kit, changed version on a spreadsheet. So you're going to have to go through that difference and process to have built a Kobe difference and tool to make sure you can get the right information to be persisted in the database so the information is always right. And which which Kobe sheets have been merged against this model? All checked. Who did it? When they did it? Why they did it? Simple. Say simple. Not simple at all. It was really hard. And then we bought, in, bought a piece of software called Priority One, which is a mobile platform. And right now, that does a lot of really great work of capturing information, form-based processes from site. But the future I want to see for this is how do we get people on site to fill in the information in Kobe without them ever seeing Kobe? The door installer, the boiler installer, doesn't need to see a multicolored spreadsheet. It's not his world. He installs things. But he does need to give us the manufacturing number and the serial number and the install date. He should fill that into a form, and we'll suck it into the database and put it in the right place. Multicolored spreadsheets are not the manufacturer's world and the installer's world. And if there isn't a model, don't worry about it. We do the whole process around Kobe as well. As many people have come on the stage and said, IFC's richer. There's a lot more in it. But if you're in, in a project where it's all Kobe based, the same tools work. We have the errors and warnings. We have the checking. We have the editing, export and merge tools. They're all there. And this one, I had it up on the screen earlier in a smaller version, but you can see it now. You choose which sheets matter at which stage and which, which parts of that sheet matter at which stage. And that defines the errors and warnings. So what's wrong with the file? Red, amber, green. Errors. Errors are counted as things that are due on the project but aren't there yet uh, at the stage, so they're, they're at a later stage. And the warnings are simply things that should be in the next stage. So get in touch. I'm not a salesman, but we have plenty of salesmen who would love to speak to you. But if you want to talk tech, here's my details, and you can get me on Twitter. Thank you, everyone.
are there any questions for John? You'll be no. around for a while? Yes, I'm, I'm here till the end of the day. Do you have a booth too, no? Yes. Okay, there's also a booth uh, in the back. Um, there is one request that when you got, you can take pictures all you want. If you could uh, put them on silent so the clicking um, gets, so that was a request by the audience. Um, okay, next um, is Hobart Bell, which I'm proud to um, be able to uh, introduce. Hobart and I work together on the data dictionary, but um, it's a, it's a, opportunity for him to show you what's really in there. I, I mentioned it, and it is something I'm very proud of to talk about, but Hobart's going to talk about a little bit more and how it, it will impact your life in the near future. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, probably some of you have heard about the data dictionary. Uh, maybe some of you haven't. I'll try to explain how this fits in with everything, uh, and I'll try to show you why this is important for you going forward. I'll call this the missing link because I think it's still missing in a lot of software. It's still missing for a lot of processes, and we need to kind of make that happen. Now imagine that you own one country. Okay, think about that. It's kind of a good feeling. Now. You have invented roads, and you have invented buses. And there's a bus coming into your country full of people. Luckily, some of these people have passports. It's an internationally recognized identity card or identity thing, which means that you can go on board that bus, and you can ask everyone with a passport to give it to you, and you can see that you know this is the person. There's a picture, there's a name, and you kind of get the idea of where this peop this this guy or girl is from. But some of them do not have a passport, so you go up and you ask. Maybe they do understand your language, maybe not. You can see what the person looked like, but you have no registry where this person is registered. So, are you willing to let that person into your country or not? I think uh, if you imagine that bus being a model, a building information model, and the data inside is the people, if those data inside do not have a building smart data dictionary tag attached to it, it's like letting a person into your project without a passport. Okay, so you really want to know what BSDD is all about, building smart data dictionary. It's like this. <clears throat> You know, I, uh, my words came out fine. It's just your brain did not process this correctly. And that's exactly what's happening in the construction industry. You know, you said it was a corridor, but the analysis software couldn't read your way of spelling corridor. So it messed up everything. The building smart organization has developed essentially three main standards. One of them is saying how you exchange data. That's the IFC model, building smart data model. Building smart is also be talking about process. What kind of information or which information are you exchanging at what time with whom? That's building smart process, IDM, MVDXML. You have all kinds of names for that. And finally, what kind of information are you exchanging? You know, there are plenty of spaces in the IFC data model where you only have um, a text box. You can put in anything you like. What do you know what that is? IFC wall? Is that a, um, a brick wall or is there something else? What is it? You need to know. So that's why the Building Smart Data Dictionary exists, is to take care of the what. And it's all about connecting two things. It's about communication between two separate entities, two different software systems, two different uh, persons, two different roles, two different faces, what have you. So you need to connect those dots. And we do not want to have this wall between, which is pretty much the way it works right now. 
So imagine that you are going into the store to get a new light bulb. I realize that light bulbs are kind of out of fashion, but uh, bear with me, I think you'll understand. Uh, you need to know the socket size, otherwise you can miss, it, can, it may not match your lamp. Uh, you probably need to know the wattage, uh, otherwise the lamp can be too strong and burn up your lamp. Uh, maybe you're interested in the light output to know how strong of light. Uh, maybe you're interested in lifetime, but certainly if you're a maintenance guy, you would like to know about the lifetime of a light bulb. So there are some information here. Some of it you recognize and use every day when you go buy a light bulb and something you don't. But there are other ways of writing this. Lumen is one way of saying light output. Watt is one way of kind of describing wattage. Size instead of socket size and expected life instead of lifetime. Now how will a, a computer know what's the difference? So imagine that the electrical engineer is uh, contributing into a project. Uh, he wants to put light bulbs into the project and maybe put a, a light bulb into the model. Um, so he adds the light bulb in there and uh, he has a, an object library on his software, part of his, uh, his system. He just drags and drops and put it in there. Maybe it's not realistic to do a light bulb, but maybe more like an electrical system of some sorts, but bear with me. So in that uh, object library, it says Lumen for uh, that's what he's interested in. How much light does this emit and how much is this an office or a whatever, a wardrobe or something. But maybe that object library said light output instead of Lumen. We really do not know. It's a random thing, it's made locally, it's nothing coordinated. So we can be lucky, we understand what it is, or we may not be lucky. The builder has the same thing. He's working on the same light bulb, but he's interested in the lumen, the wattage, and the socket size. That's where he's coming from. And the maintainer, well, lumen, wattage, and socket size, and expected lifetime. So he's, it's the same light bulb, but he's just interested in different things. You all know this. Environmental guy, wattage, waste, production. How much CO2 went into producing this light bulb? How much went into transporting it to the construction site? So you have all these different roles that are interested in different aspects of the same light bulb. Now how are we going to make those guys be able to communicate across everything and understand the different aspects of this light bulb? So it's a problem of namespace. I mean, you're lucky if your object library happens to use the namespace that you use, or the same kind of characters to describe this. But if you're talking to somebody with a different language than you, forget it. Namespace, all you want. So there's a number of ways of doing this. Here are two options. You can have a controlled vocabulary where you say, this is the definition, here's the naming convention, we have decided this. Let's go for this, and uh, socket size, you always write it S-O-C-K-E-T space S-I-Z-E, -E. always. That's simple and understandable, everybody grasps that, but it's not easily enforceable by software. If you ask a Chinese guy to say socket size like that, maybe not so interested. And you need to be very specific, very correct. Option two, use Billing Smart Data Dictionary. It's a much better option, of course. It's machine enabled, allows for use of natural language variations, so you can call it whatever you want, but it has a unique identification for the software to understand and present it to you in your language, in your preference. This requires implementation in software, so it takes a while. It's also an international um, effort. It's not something I can just do back home in Norway and expect it to work everywhere else. We need an international community to, to make this happen. But it's the best and most scalable consistent solution to this problem. That's the approach of the Building Smart Data Dictionary. So again, you have the electrical, the builder, the maintainer, environmental guy. They all talk to their different software systems, different libraries, different this, different that. So you really don't know. But if they all had connected to the Building Smart Data Dictionary, they all would have spoken the same language and it would be transferable between one to the other. You see where I'm getting at? 
So you have lumen or light output, same thing. It's given one tag in the data dictionary. Lifetime or expected life, it's given another tag in the data dictionary. What, wattage, another tag in the data dictionary. Size, socket size, you get the idea. So you have uh, the data dictionary with all these tags, unique identifications, global unique identifiers, GUIs, GUIDs, whatever you want to name it. But it's in a unique identification, understood by computers. And the computer can then just ask to represent it in whatever way it wants. In Japanese, in Korean, Norwegian, English, British English, United States English, whatever. So finally, there is a common language that makes this work. So you should go home now, or Twitter, or call, or whatever you have to do, to every single software vendor that you use in your projects and ask them, do you support the Bailey Smart Data Dictionary? Have you implemented an integration to the Bailey Smart Data Dictionary? If the answer is no, I'll push them and say, well, how do you expect me to communicate if you don't fix this? Now here's in the perspective on an elephant. You have different guys seeing different sides of the big animal and understanding it differently. An elephant is like a big snake. What are you saying? It's like a slith of leather. You're all wrong. It's actually like a little furry mouse. Actually, no, it's like a tree stump. You understand how everybody is seeing the world a little bit differently. And you can also see this whole thing a little differently. It's the same thing, but it's just drawn differently. Some different uh, points that you, it's a fan, it's a wall, it's a rope. So everybody sees the world a little different. Nobody sees it the same because we're all unique and wonderful individuals. The Building Smart <coughs> Data Dictionary tries to <coughs> unify all this. Uh, there are different classification systems allowing you to see the world a little bit differently. All these classification systems can go into the Building Smart Data Dictionary. No problem. The Building Smart Data Dictionary allows for different ways of viewing the world. Which means the ETIM standard can say product X has property A, B, and C. While Omniclass says product X has property A, B, and D. So they're seeing the world a little bit differently. Nothing is more wrong or correct than the other. It's just different emphasis. The Building Smart Data Dictionary allows the product X to be seen as through Omniclass glasses or through ETIM glasses or through both glasses. Well, let me try to show you what this could look like. A little bit technical, but bear with me, I'm sorry. Uh, this is uh, the documentation for IFC4. If you click on this link, which is present for every single P set in the model, you will get to this page. This page is a view of the property set data pulled out of the data dictionary on the fly. You can also view this as the standardized PSD form of a P set. Again, pulled straight out of the data dictionary. So all the IFC 4 P sets lives inside the data dictionary. They're pulled out. If somebody adds a language, it's automatically there in the XML file. This is a view of the data in the data dictionary through the official browser. Uh, it gives you the same property set, but with a little different view and with different information on it. Uh, we've also developed a way to compare various ways of looking at the world and see how things compare. That's a powerful way of moving on. And a minor flaw in the IFC model is that the thermal transmittance property that exists in many different property sets, slab common, P set, plate common, P set, B, beam common, etc., they are the exact same property, but in the computerized world of the IFC, they're actually different properties. Now, it doesn't make sense, but it's the way it was, was. Until now, when you have the data dictionary, we can merge this together and make it appear as one. Even though all the GUIDs that we used uh, will answer, it will answer with the exact same thing. It's the same thing that everyone has.
It's a way of making things easier. Uh, this is a project. Um, it's a, a, an open BIM platform. It shows you a model uh, that's in here. I can click on a wall and it will give you information attached to that object. Now in this case, what we have done is to take a product database with product information like assembly instructions, product declarations, uh, safety data sheets, all that stuff inside the product database. And that product database from CoBuilder in Norway has built their entire system around building smart data dictionary, which means that every single piece of information in that database has this unique tag, which we as an independent open BIM platform vendor can understand because we also talk with the Building Smart Data Dictionary. So that allows us to automatically filter on the big list of products that comes into a construction site. We can filter away what's not relevant once you click on an object. And we can say, well, for this wall, you're not going to be interested in, uh, an, um, uh, let's say, an electrical uh, heating system. You're interested in the gypsum board or something like that. And here is... Uh, the very list of all the products inside this database mm -hmm. and since it's connected to the building smart data dictionary I can actually translate into from Norwegian to English so watch this and you have something that you can understand do you see you see that I presented you something in Norwegian there was no way for anybody else but me to understand that in a sense translated it to British English, and now all you guys can see what it is because of the Building Smart Data Dictionary. The Building Smart Data Dictionary is uh, a service. It lives out there on the internet. It's built on the Google infrastructure. So when Google's infrastructure goes down, so does the Building Smart Data Dictionary. If not, it stays up and it's infinitely scalable. We try this. We've hammered on that service. It doesn't even glitch. The Building Smart Data Dictionary is a service of the Building Smart International. It has an API. It's a server. It's a database. It's something that you can access through your software. It's managed by the product room. If you have content, get involved. If you're a software vendor with a use case, get involved. If you guys know some software vendors, make them get involved. And Roger Grant, are you here today? He's right over there. Get in touch with him if you're interested in getting involved. He will guide you through the process. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you, Howard. Are there any questions for Howard? Okay. All right. Can I ask a question to the audience? Yes, please. So which one of you will go home and talk to your software vendors? Very good. Very good. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. All right. OK, Rosso? Um, Another one of my colleagues at uh, Inter uh, Building Smart International, Rosso, uh, is here to talk about validation and checking. There you go. <coughs> Hello together. Thank you for letting me speak here. I would like to introduce to you uh, the <coughs> certification efforts which we undertake in Building Smart. Uh, just a short introduction for me, for, for those who, who don't know me. I'm a professor um, for uh, IT and construction in Munich. I'm uh, leading their uh, institute, which is heavily involved in um, BEM. Uh, I'm collaborating with the Nemechek Group. Uh, I'm chairman of a new initiative in VDI. VDI is uh, one of the largest associations of engineers with 150,000 uh, members and 16,000 members for the construction industry. And I'm uh, uh, working on different levels 
uh, and roles in Building Smart International. Um, in Building Smart, we are thinking about several certifications, and today I will only talk about the software certification. Um, but we are also thinking about the certification of design data, so certifying data which are produced during design drops. We are thinking of, about certifying product data, stuff what uh, we just heard. We're thinking about certifying individuals. So this week we started to work on this here, and I can tell you this was not so easy because there is a lot of interest in it and a lot of different conflicting interests. So this is uh, uh, something we're just focusing on. Uh, we're also thinking about certifying companies. So if you're a company and you would like to express yourself that you're able to perform BIM, uh, then such a certificate, certificate would be uh, maybe a very nice marketing tool for you. So software certification. Um, we already started with a certification uh, a couple of years ago. And the idea of the first certification was a sort that we randomly check uh, whether an implementer is able to implement IFC. And we thought each implementer is responsible for its product, so they will check the quality by themselves. Uh, this really didn't work out. So Building Smart came back to Thomas Liebig and me, and they asked me to set up a new certification scheme, which we did. And this certification scheme is really a very detailed test of the IFC interfaces. So um, the three organizations here are uh, operating the Building Smart, uh, the, the certification of IFC, um, on behalf of Building Smart. Um, here you see what we need if you want to certify. If you want to certify, you always need something which is very clear what you certify against. So from the end users, ideally, we get exchange requirements as part of their IDMs, the Information Deliver Delivery, Delivery Manual. The technical response to these IDMs are these so-called model view definition, and the model view definition is a subset of the overall uh, IFC model, which um, fulfills specific requirements from the end users. Here you also see how IDM, uh, how IFD links in. IFD is the same as Building Smart Data Dictionary. This is an old slide. Earlier it was called IFD. Today it's Building Smart Data Dictionary. Data Dictionary. So here you see in this slide how, how it all fits together. So as a certifier, we take the MBDs, and the MBDs is uh, on the one side um, the requirement for the software vendors, and it's on the other side the uh, level what we have to check uh, um, uh, for, for, um, um, for the software vendors. So the certification itself is dealing with um, uh, import and export uh, of IFC data. So we are examining this, uh, we are evaluating this, and we are documenting everything what we find. Um, the idea is that, in principle, we can certify various model view definitions. However, up to now, we only had interest to, certi to get uh, of certification for the so-called coordination view. I will come to this a little bit later. Um, the current status is we have 38 registered uh, applications and 25 already went successfully through this uh, certification for export and import or import only or export only. This depends on the type of the application. Um, on the Building Smart website, you c can find an up-to-date table, so as soon as a new application gets certified, it's automatically published on the Building Smart website, and you can monitor this there. Um, in addition to this, there's also very close communication between the software vendors and the certification team, the auditors, um, because if there is an issue, you have to check, is this because the audio auditor didn't under understand the application right? Or also, uh, sometimes uh, even the software vendors need some advice, um, and especially the software vendors who are new in implementing IFC uh, need some even, some even some training to really understand what they have to do. So the coordination view actually is covering um, the um, uh, coordination between uh, the disciplines architecture, MAP, and structural. So for each of the communication flows between MAP to struct, arc to struct, arc to MAP, we have a sub view definition of this overall coordination view. We already had a coordination view earlier, which was the coordination view 1.0, and we experienced that with gaining interest, we get, got more and more requirements. So this coordination, this first over coordination view 
got overloaded. And then what happened that a structural engineering application was supposed to read in a door while the structural engineer is only interested in the opening. So these applications tried as hard as they could and imported a door, but a structural engineering application has no idea of a door swing, for instance. So the doors open in the wrong side, and end user said, here you see, IFC doesn't work. Okay, so this, uh, and we had a lot of these examples. So therefore, we came up uh, to the understanding that we have to be more specific in these uh, view definitions. So therefore, we have these three sub-view definitions um, here. Uh, I think this is somehow important to know for use because later when you see the certification logo, um, then you may better understand what this means. Um, so what we do, we are uh, uh, providing test instructions. Uh, you will see some of them in, uh, in a couple of minutes. And so these are detailed this, this, uh, 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 instructions. And the goal is that we are uh, uh, providing different um, scenarios, different modeling uh, scenarios. Uh, and um, with this, we want to test the basic concepts. What we also allow is that the software vendors are providing tests because some vendors know if I export something with IFC, other software vendors have, import, uh, have uh, problems importing them. So if there are these nasty, tricky examples, the software vendors can provide this to the testing scenarios um, to make sure that uh, also on the import, uh, these nasty examples um, could be uh, supported. And then we have so-called replacement tests. So if an uh, application just doesn't have a specific function, then uh, some of the test cases are just not applicable. And for this, we have replacement tests. So here, seen, here you can see an example. So this is an example for beams. Uh, so we have beams in different angels and uh, uh, different intersections and so on. This is a description. Uh, and this is what the software vendor who wants to export the file or has to export the file, this is what he gets on the table. So the um, um, quality testing team, they get this information and they have to model this thing in their application. So these are just typical examples and you see it's, it, it's very detailed. And as soon as they have modeled this in their application, and here you have even an example for uh, a small building, we rather like small examples because if there is a problem, you find them easier in small examples than in whole buildings. So if you, we can take whole buildings. Um, they are quite good for random tests, but finding issues in, in big building examples is quite uh, difficult. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is a, from, from, from the elect electrical side a test instruction. So as soon as the implementers have modeled this, they are uploading uh, this um, uh, file, and then the, uh, the, uh, an auditor comes up and he checks the file, and if, if everything is nice, uh, the next thing can be checked. Uh, the whole thing is set up on a web-based application. Um, so uh, this is called the Global Testing and Documentation Server, GTTS. And uh, so behind we have a, a database, on this database, we are providing all these uh, test instructions. Each implementer can register on this database. As soon as an implementer registers, he gets the uh, test cases or uh, test instructions which are relevant for him. Then he starts uh, modeling, uploading IFC files. As soon as he uploads an IFC file, the, uh, the auditor gets an alert he, so he can uh, check the IFC file. Uh, the, the implementer can monitor the process so he can see now something is under, uh, under, under auditing. And then if test files go through, that's okay. If not, they go back to the implementer, so the implementer gets an alert. So the whole workflow is supported by this uh, uh, um, system, so it's a workflow uh, system for uh, checking. There's also uh, the Jasper server for the reports. And we have here this checking tool, and uh, we'll talk about this uh, in, in a second, um, an automatic checking tool. And we have um, also, and this is a very nice support from a company, IFC uh, Tools Project. So they offer us, us their uh, IFC viewer. And this is a very specific viewer because this also allows to look into the code of the file. So if there's an issue, it's like those of you who do programming and you, you know pro debuggers. So if there's an issue, you can actually see the line in the file where the, where the problem comes up. So this is this uh, viewer, which, uh, which is very helpful for us. Um, 
So GTTS provides um, several services. Um, so uh, there is one automating checking tool, but this is uh, for the, uh, uh, actually for the earlier coordination view. So this is out of date, so we're about to, to close this thing because I think this is no, lo longer, no, no longer relevant. For building smart members, uh, there's the possibility you can um, log in there, um, and the, here as end users you can meet really the people who are implementing I IFC. So if you have an IFC file which is tricky and you think <coughs> implementers should look into this IFC file, here you can meet them, you can upload your IFC file and you can say, please look at this, I think there's a problem in this. Uh, and so, uh, so this is, uh, so this is, you can somehow, somehow bypass the hotlines here. <laughs> um, for the uh, uh, BSI members who are also going for uh, certification, they have this so-called certification center where they get the, the online checking, the test cases, the monitoring, and so on. Implementers who, have, who are operating internationally, they also have their developers uh, spread out in different countries. So the product managers, they can see how their teams who are not necessarily sitting in the same, same building, how the teams are performing and how their progress is uh, uh, in the certification process. Um, yeah, here you see the user interface, how this looks like, um, but maybe that's not too interesting. Um, this is uh, a, t a slide about this checking tool. So what uh, this does, um, it takes actually the uh, IFC schema and um, then a part of the stuff uh, of the, out of the schema definition, which for the experts here in this uh, room, it's this express, that's another story. Um, so out of this express code, you can automatically generate checking rules. And these checking rules are validating whether an IFC file complies to the schema. Those of you who are familiar with Solibri, Solibri is something else. Solibri is checking whether you modeled right or not. This checking tool is checking whether an IFC file complies to the schema itself. So it's something, something different. And we also have so-called implementer agreements. So what's that? Um, the uh, IFC schema, like all other standard um, schemas, is providing quite some ambiguity. So you can export geometry explicit, parametric driven, whatever. So there are different possibilities. So if we support all um, possibilities, then the import becomes very challenging. So therefore implementers agree on to reduce the freedom or ambiguity um, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the IFC or, or how, we use, how we use the IFC schema. So these are the implemented uh, um, uh, agreements. They are public available, so they are on the Building Smart websites. The rules which are in the implemented agreements, they have to be um, uh, edited manually in this checking tool. And then uh, the, uh, the checking tool is uh, running on the server, it's running the silent, and it's generating an XML report. So here you see uh, what, what, uh, what could be in, in uh, this uh, XML report. And maybe there's an error uh, which um, causes a conflict with an implementer agreement. And if you get this error message, you can click on this thing and you uh, end up in the implementer agreement and, and you can read where the problem is. So the workflow is uh, for the expert is uh, you, the um, software vendor downloads the in instruction, he models the test case, he exports his file, uh, he uploads the file to GTTS, we have the automatic checking. If, it's, if there is an error, uh, it goes back. If no, then we have the manual checking. Um, uh, if this is okay, then it's done. If not, uh, it goes back. Um, so we, our experience is that for the manual check, we need about five hours per uh, test file or per exported file. And um, for the recheck, we need some more two or two and a half hours. And um, so in total, we have in, in the meantime thousands of checks. So it is a real huge effort. There's a lot of manpower going into this. So we're thinking um, heavily how we can reduce the manual check. Uh, the final answer is not yet there. Maybe the, we have some ideas, but the manual check for the export is still a huge effort. Also, about 50% of the files which come out here have a, at least a second or third round. Uh, this is uh, how these, um, um, uh, the, uh, um, and, um, the report looks like from the checking tool, and then you click, can click on it and you find the details about the problem. 
Um, then when the manual check comes, it goes down really to each single detail and on the level of each single detail, then uh, um, it, the auditor can say it's supported or it's not supported and he can uh, add here some comments. And so then the uh, implementer on the other side can see what the uh, auditor brought up and he can react that. So we can, in this year, we can also see the whole history, how the, any problems were fixed. For import, there is unfortunately no possibility to automatic, automatic check anything. You have to do it manually. However, the effort to run uh, import is not so much. It's about seven days what we need uh, to uh, check, um, uh, to, to audit an import, uh, an import application. And yeah, in this case, you uh, download the files, the calibration files from, from GTTS. So all files which are exported and which are checked and uh, where we think these files are okay, these files become calibration files. So in the meantime, we have a very huge repository of files which were exported from the various applications and they serve as calibration files for the, for the import test. And what we do out of this huge repository, one day before the actual auditing of the import, we select randomly um, a couple of these files and um, then uh, uh, we start this uh, manual checking. And usually this is done in a face-to-face -face meeting. It also can be done on a, with a web conference, which is a little bit tiring, but uh, it's, it's uh, uh, better to, to do it in a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, so the result at the end is um, a documentation of the whole thing. Um, so it is at the end a, um, uh, a report. Uh, this report is published on this table where we are, um, where we have all certified applications. So everybody who is interested in this, you just can, can go to the Building Smart website, look which uh, applications are certified, and you can uh, download this uh, PDF report. It's very detailed. Uh, it's very lengthy, um, and but if you're a little bit experienced, then uh, this report could be quite helpful for you. In that, as add-on to the certification, we have a discussion forum, we have bi-weekly uh, uh, telecoms with the implementers, we have the implementer support group, which has uh, uh, meetings each uh, seven months, where we are uh, helping the implementers to run through the certification. So what does this certification mean? And here I made an analogy to the car industry. You find this uh, picture also on the Building Smart, web Building Smart website. In the car industry, they have internal quality checks and the same software vendors have. And some software vendors even get certified for being able to uh, use a specific te technology. And then we have like, things like the NCAP crash test, or in Germany we have TÜV, so each second year you have to take your car to TÜV, and they check whether it's still okay or not. So that's what we're doing here. So it's, uh, our certification is like a crash test. Um, still, then we have uh, magazines or sports clubs and they drive the cars like hell and eventually find an, some more problems. So in addition here on the, on, the, on the IFC side, we have Corps of Engineers, we have GSA, name it, and they also have a cl very close look whether the IFC files uh, are in accordance to their requirements. So this means we really need everything to finally come up with high quality um, IFC files. Um, if you now say, well, this is a certified software and I still see a problem, this may occur. Also, when you ran through such a test with your car, it could be that you go leave this building and you pull the brake and it doesn't work. It can happen. So um, this test can only um, uh, test specific scenarios, but it could be that you produce a scenario which we don't have in the test. So therefore, um, I already talked to um, Jeff Stevens, uh, who gave a presentation earlier. Um, when you have experience from the end using side, where you say, I know this is a tricky problem, uh, and uh, again and again, I see here a problem in the IFC interface. Please give this example to us, and we will put this into the test instructions for the next certifications. So this would be really helpful for us uh, if you uh, would, uh, if you know about such ELK tests, tell the, give us this ELK test to us so that we can put them into the test instructions. At the end, the software vendors get such a certificate 
And these logos uh, are telling a small uh, story. So this means it's import and export certified for coordination view two under the architectural aspect. This is export only. This is import export structural. This is export only structural. Uh, so this is an overview. Uh, so later on, if you want to go through the slides, you can just wrap up. And here you have all, also some um, links to the Building Smart websites where you can dig into the, um, the information directly. So what's going on in future? In future, of course, we're thinking about IFC4 and we're thinking about BCF. It was a little bit interesting to me that during this conference, BCF was not really mentioned, and I wondered why I was not asked to talk about this, but we just had a hint on this in the, the uh, presentation right after, the, after lunch, so I will give you a very brief introduction to BCF and then uh, explain to you what we're going to do there regarding certification. So, um, this was too fast. Um, so for the new certification for IFC4, um, we are uh, we got quite a lot of stuff out of the learning curve. So we will look into the um, um, uh, test instructions. What we learned there, we found that some test instructions are very good. We found that we can improve other test instructions. Also, we got experiences from end users, which we will go into the test instructions. Um, we will actually re-implement the GTTS because the technology which we're using there is now already five, six years old. In the meantime, we have better web-based technology, uh, so we will do, do this. And in this GTTS, we will also support this BCF, this BIM collaboration format, um, which is quite uh, interesting for implementers <coughs> who are also supporting this, because with this here, they can get automatically any issues which the auditors find. They can synchronize this audit automatically with their applications and can address the problem in their application. And uh, yeah, the, our partner from Karlsruhe will leave the team. Uh, we are just about to get a new partner into this for, and we will get a new checking tool for automatic checking. Um, data round trip. Um, again and again, end users are saying we need data round trip. And if I dig into details and ask them what, why they need a data round trip, then in reality, they don't need a data round trip. What they need, they want to give somebody else a change. And the way you, you do it today, you make a change, and then you send the whole bulk IFC file to your partner, and he has to filter out what, which change you made. And then you, the, the whole thing goes back. And then, of course, you want to have a data round trip. Uh, but what you actually really want is a workflow to support this. So the better thing is to do, use BCF and IFC to do this. And, and I will explain you in a second why this is uh, a better idea. There are some really few examples where indeed you need data round trip. Well, what, what, you, what you really need is a handover to another process as good as possible. So I think rather just demanding we need data, data round trip, we, just, we should go into details and see and, and identify which needs there are really. And then we should try, try, uh, take care to really support this need and not just say data round. Round trip. So, data round trip is a great idea for uh, to, to check because right, if, you, if we do data round tripping during the certification, we find some issues. But using data round trip really to certify data round trip, that's not a really a good idea. So, I said BCF is better. What is BCF? Um, if you want to coordinate, let's say, the architect's model with the MEP model, you can export an IFC file out of an architect's application and um, uh, building service information out of an MEP application. And you can put this on a server, uh, maybe just uh, uh, you, you use the files. You can import this in, in a, an application. We have viewers where you can import this, where you can bring these two, this, um, two parts together. And if you now find, have, have an issue, uh, and you want to tr transport this issue from this application to this if you, I application. For this, we have now BCF. And this BCF this is a so-called BIM co collaboration format. You could say it is a BIM email. And the first step what we did, we made a BIM co this BIM collaboration format as an XML file. So today, if you have an issue, you could, and your application is supporting it, you could um, transport this issue via an XML file. You could attach it to an email and send it to somebody else. If 
you really use it, you will find that you will get many, many, many of this uh, VCF XML files. And doing this by email causes a lot of questions. So did I really send the last this latest issue? Uh, how do you transport it? Uh, it is mixing up with all my other emails. Uh, um, is everybody aware of the, of the uh, last change and so on? So doing this with sending around BCS with, with files is maybe not the best uh, approach. So therefore, the better approach is to send around BCFs via a hub. So the idea is that in future you have a BCF server, like today you have email servers. So um, the email server, you don't care about this. You have your mobile device, and it makes bling, and you have your email. So the, your email application is automatically synchronizing, synchronizing with the email server. So in future, the, your BIM application will automatically synchronize with such BCF servers. And if somebody raises an issue which is relevant for you, then you get a bling, and you know, and you can click on it, and you see in your model where the issue is. And you don't have to deal around with sending <coughs> issues to somebody else and sending back issues to, to, to somebody else. So, and the solution for this is this so-called BCF API. The BCF API is a web service which allows applications to automatically synchronize BIM issues. And <clears throat> while this is already a, B, a BIM's uh, a Building Smart standard, we, start, uh, we approved this um, last November, we just started the auditing phase. So you have here a website, and um, the team which worked on this uh, definition uh, it came now to a point where they um, had no major uh, issues any longer. They're just working on editorial stuff. If you are techie, you can go to this website. If you're not techie, go to this website. If you're an end user, go to this website and look if there is one of your vendors there active, because we have a couple of vendors there. And if there are a couple of vendors, discuss with them this idea. Uh, and just play through together with them, with, with these vendors, some scenarios. Um, because this is, this is now important in this balloting phase, which is two months, that we just check, double check, whether we thought and uh, had, uh, thought about everything so that we don't get any showstoppers. So please use this two months and not wait until the end of the balloting and then come up with issues. It would be better to bring up issues now. All right, that's, uh, yeah, in, in the future, of course, uh, we will also certify this thing, um, which um, the nice thing here is that this is not such a huge thing that, as I've seen. This is a very compact uh, um, uh, format, so the effort to certify applications which are supporting this is not such a big thing than uh, the effort which we have with IFC files. All right, so thank you very much. Uh, maybe there are some questions, but I'm afraid that you're also going out of steam. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, what, one thing that he did bring up, Rasa brought up, is you know, one of the things that we, we are not do, we're not um, doing as well as we could and should do better is when these standards are, are about to come out, so they're candidate, they're, they're, they're been through the technical and everything, now they need to be out in the market a little bit or at least have it available for the market to try because the goal of Building Smart International is to have standards that come out have value, have value in use. So when we have these two-month periods, we really need to be pushing down to the chapters and asking the users, and we'll bring them in earlier too so it won't be just a two-month period, but in this case, um, it, you know, we're sitting here with this opportunity to double check and make sure the, that the BCF in, in the softwares that you already have actually will work and that it makes sense. So, you know, take an opportunity, really look at this. I know that since some of the software, I think it has a lot of opportunity, but we really want to make sure it meets the needs of the users. And we believe it does, but we really like you to try it. So I really would like to back Rasso on the, the whole concept of, of looking it up and, and seeing if it makes sense for you. So yep. that would really help. So I appreciate that. Um, and we were lucky that um, in this uh, team which uh, made the specification, we already had a, a mm -hmm. very good end user. Sure. It was Hen, maybe you know Hen Architects in Munich. Um, and uh, so they have very co competent IT people also. So they know both sides. So they supported us there. Yeah. All right. Any further questions? <laughs> See when I import an IFC into a different authoring tool, 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So this this this. Yeah, you're right. So this uh, can happen while uh, it's not a problem of IFC. It's a problem of, of the of the implementation. So not all um, applica applications um, can support this idea what you just described that you have one type and then you have um, um, hundreds of instances of this. Some of them can, and then they transport this actually correctly. And those who, can, who are not this concept or, or who have, don't, don't have this functionality, there you end up in this problem. That's right. So type is described. It is there. Yeah, sure, sure, it is. It is there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. Anything else? So thank you very much. Thank you. Too. <laughs> I, I will make a, a comment on that because. Um, I think sometimes IOC gets the bad rap, and, and it's not that the software can't do it. It's, we can't do it, <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's not push button yet. And there is some stuff, and, and I think that's one of the things we also will be pushing more, a little more training, you know, how, how, as a user, how, how do I export out and, and I'm in different software? Because there is some little tweaks to it you got to do, and if you don't know, which you probably, you know, most of us wouldn't, you are going to get something where you, you push the button, it goes out the coordination view, and you open it up, and nothing's there. You don't know why. You know, it doesn't work. Well, no, there's some, some certain steps that need to be taken. And, and so I just want to be clear that, you know, there's parts of us that, that we need to get to you. So it's not the certification. It's not really the software. Sometimes it's just us. <laughs> and so that's one of those things I just want to also be clear on because I think that helps when you understand what the limitations of the software exports are so you understand what you're getting. It might not be what you want, but at least you know why it's there and you're, you're doing it because of, it, it, of the way the process is. And then we'll need the feedback so we ensure that we can work with the, them. Maybe. Anyway, so that was, that was great. Thank you, Russell. That was really good.